Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy, and today I've got a special guest, Bill Cheswick, whom I've known for a number of years. But first, let's take a moment to hear from today's sponsor. Obsidian Security protects the applications businesses rely on most. We're the first and only comprehensive security solution built for SaaS. Our SaaS security posture management platform helps reduce enterprise risk by proactively identifying SaaS misconfigurations, detecting real-time threats, and enabling visibility into risky SaaS integrations. Learn more at obsidiansecurity.com slant SSPM. And now back to our show. We're actually sitting here in a undisclosed location in the mountains of California at a conference that is, well, not well publicized. And so, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a gentleman who's been around in this industry longer than I have. And it's like my hair gets a little bit grayer. That's more increasingly difficult to find. But anyway, Bill, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Now, one of my earlier things I think I got from you years ago was a map of the internet. Well, tell me a little bit about your background. How, where did you get started? What got you involved in what you're doing? Uh, I mean, you've, you've been around for and contributed so much over the years. Yeah, I guess the story begins in, junior, in, in high school at Lawrenceville in uh, junior year when I, I was going to be a chemist. I was one of these teenage chemists who did things like make metallic sodium by electrolyzing molten sodium hydroxide, which is a, don't try that at home. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? Well, you could get spattered with molten hydro sodium hydroxide and you have little bubbles of, of sodium metal bobbing around. And I also distilled liquid bromine, which later professor said is the second most caustic substance he's ever dealt with other than phosphorus. So I was going to be a chemist, but junior year, the math department had this machine in the corner, and it was a Model 33 teletype. And I thought to myself, hmm, computers, they're the wave of the future. I should learn a little more about them. And that pretty much was one of the two great career decisions I made based just with about that amount of force. And I went to Lehigh, and after a year in chemistry, I realized that I was spending all my time in the computing center. So I started playing with the CDC 6400 and mainframes and so on. and by the mid-1980s, I was a consultant, sort of a hired IT guy, system programmer is what we were called at the time. And then I was working at N NJIT, and they were connecting to this network. And I thought, hmm, networks, they're the wave of the future. I should learn a little more about them. And two years later, that job was sort of gone. And someone said, a friend of mine said, why don't you apply to Bell Labs? And I thought, well, you know, I... I would be happy to be janitor to Dennis Ritchie and the people who invented Unix. You know, I can help them out a lot and, you know, who knows? And I went and I had a day's interview with some of the gods of Unix and, at Bell Labs. And even if at the end of the day they decided I was a jerk and don't show my face there again, it would have been amazing. But they said, sure, come on aboard. And <laughs> so I arrived. Uh, Dave Prisato was running his firewall. And I said, you know, I'd love to be postmaster email postmaster, which is a thankless job. If you do it right, nobody notices. And if you do it wrong, they miss critical email and rip your lungs out. But I, you know, it was a great way to learn. This, this was when the ARPANET was just sort of going away and becoming NSFNet and there were lots of different networks and so on. So I ran the firewall and a key moment in my security career was about four months after I got there, the firewall that David set up, I, I was sitting there late one afternoon, sort of lazy, ready to go home. And I looked through etsyinetd.conf, which is a list of network services that this exposed machine had. And one of them was called FingerD, and it ran as root. Well, it was the end of the day, and I didn't know what FingerD was. And I said, I'll turn it off, and if someone doesn't like it, you know, they'll complain, and then I'll learn what it is. But I just shut it off. And of course, that was one of the three ways that the Morris worm spread several months later. And we, Dave had replaced the other two ways. So this was security by being lazy and lucky. This was 1988, November 1988. And I said, you know, security by being lucky does not sound like a good plan. And I sat down and I redesigned the firewall. And I basically put in two. I called them belt and suspenders. Mm -hmm. You had to go through. So two, with, you know, I, two little diodes in the diagram. And I set it up. And 
I'm not a PhD, but, you know, I'm sitting in little labs with PhDs writing papers and stuff. And I said, I'm, I'll write this up. And I wrote a paper and showed it to my boss, Fred Gramp, a security light in his own right. And he read through and said, this is a good paper. Submitted it to Usenix. And that was my first publication. Quote, Tamara Munzner, I was raised by wolves. And I started doing some research and a lot more support and so on. I figured if I could just help these gods of Bell Labs, you know, I'm helping out. And in fact, nowadays, in the middle of my retirement, one of my closest friends is Neil Sloan. He, he's the mathematician who started the online integer sequences. He started collecting mathematical sequences in 1964. And if you go into Google and type a series of numbers, it will go to the OEIS and look it up. And I'm Neil's IT guy. And, and we're good friends. And, you know, we do stuff. Anyway, so that's how I got started with all of this. A couple of years later, I talked to Steve Bellavin and he said, you know, we really need a book. And, and we could take these papers and staple them together. And John Waite at Addison Wesley had been bugging him for 10 years to write a book. And John Waite said, well, this is a great idea but you can't staple papers together. You've got to do it. It's sort of like, congratulations, you have 14 English themes do. And that's pretty much how I viewed writing at the time. But if you write what you know about, that makes writing much easier. It's also true for, for public speaking. And so we sat down and did a table of contents and some of the chapters, well, we need to cover this. I don't know much about it. I should sit and spend a week learning about it and so on. And the Firewalls book came out in 1994. So they told us they were going to sell eight to 10,000 copies. And the first run ran out of print in two weeks. And we ended up selling about 100,000 copies of it, plus I don't know how many languages. And that, <laughs> what a delightful surprise. And, you know, it was fun to do. The, the other thing is in school, they don't teach you how to co-author things. I mean, that's a no-no in, in grade school. But Steve and I, I'd write... I'd, the spirit would move me to write a chapter and I'd blurt out the words and I'd give it to Steve. And the next morning it would come back 30% longer, edited and more correct and interesting. I don't have to read my own writing because that's Steve's writing. And that's how the thing bounced together. And we, we edited each other. There was really no ego involved. And that's really how the career really got going. It's fascinating. So we've got the old repelling the wily hacker yes. back in the day, which of course kind of put you on the map, so to speak. In terms oh, of yeah, lots of CIO breakfasts and got invited to Renaissance Weekend and talks around the world. Turns out I've got a knack for giving public talks, so people have invited me all over the place, and it's been wonderful. So sort of like me with a face for radio, right? <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so anyway, after that early work, which, which really, as an early adopter, they were looking at things and saying, hmm, the service doesn't look right, let's yeah. turn it off, and yeah. then you're kind of dodging a bullet in a fortunate way, then, then what comes next? If you get early success in life or something like that? Well, you... well, for one thing, now I'm running the fire, my new design firewall at Bell Lab with a whole bunch of people inside who want to use the internet. But I have these rules that I've come up with with the help of people like Dave Prezado. How can he use the internet safely? And sometimes it's, well, I have this little software that will relay stuff through and, and this meets your need, just compile this and use it. And that works. And other people, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do this. We're just going to throw your machine out on the outside and you deal with it. And, you know, we had a few of those and some of them got hacked. But the whole idea of trying to accommodate the needs of the users in a way that was not awful, you, you don't want to get in the way if you don't have to. And that, that's, you know, that's how a lot of the proxies came along. That's a current challenge, I think, for a lot of our listeners as CISOs and security managers. You want to make sure that we're in the business of enabling the business and yes. also revenue protection because we don't want to go ahead and have people steal stuff from us and hack it. And yet the difficulty is, is that in general, we seem to know about our threats more than, well, the people are trying to protect do. Maybe. There's always new stuff out there. Yeah. Uh, Dilbert said defender of uh, in, in connectivity or something like that, you know, <laughs> you know preventer of, of communication, preventer of communications. Yeah. yeah. Well, it can be hard to figure out what's good and what's bad. And, and then the other thing, of course, is that that's a perimeter defense. And the, the term I used all the time was a crunchy outside with a soft, chewy center. I remember that from the nineties, your first oh, description of yes. that. And, and, and it the, turns the out I was not the first to think of that, but it, it certainly made it popular. We're circling the wagons around Wyoming. And so you really need to look on the inside and you need strong host security. 
And for most of the time since then, my own machines have been on the outside because you know they're coming after you and that really, fo you don't cheat so much. You know, if, if you took away my laptop, I don't have a secret way to get into my farm network. You know, there, there isn't some port knock here and enter this thing and do that. No, it's not there. Uh, and, and it's an interesting. So today, of course, I mean, I remember back in the 80s, it really, it was pretty much researchers and academics and a few other early adopters on there. And the idea of the Morris room, well, I mean, I knew Robert Morris Sr., at least met him. But of course, his son, I kind of thought it was interesting when the chief scientist at NSA uh, gets a call from his son, like, Dad, I broke the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did, too. <laughs> and uh, But what have we learned since then, back in November of 88, when... Oh, Lord. Uh, I mean, for those who are not familiar with it, and we probably should be at the time, is, as I remember, he was a grad student at Cornell and wrote a little routine that was designed to go ahead and basically, if I get the logic roughly described here as sort of pseudocode, find all the connections you're connected to, send a copy of yourself to there, read the local password file, send it back to this IP address, and then repeat. Mm -hmm. And that sounds pretty good. And then that's the idea of a worm. Like you go to the next one, you grab the password file, send it back to home and repeat, and then you're onto the connection. What's missing from that simple logic flow? <laughs> well, it's clear his original intent was to do this sneakily, to sneak out and go infect the world and not be noticed. But controlling exponential growth is a difficult problem as anyone who's dealt with cancer knows, and it's, a, it, it's highly analogous because we, you know, we, we living beings use exponential growth to grow up and repair wounds and, and heal and fight diseases. There's an exponential battle, but it's hard to get the code right to not have something go exponential. And his worm did. I remember, I think it was Gene Spafford found the bug or that, that made it go too quickly. And I, I think what was missing, if you ask any plumber, They'll tell you, where's the check valve? What's to keep the sewage from coming back? And there was yeah. no check valve. And so if you were connected to 10 machines, again, this is kind of a rough analysis. Wow, what is it? 35 years later almost. Yeah, it's been a while. But say, if you spread to 10 neighbors <clears throat> and then they spread to all their neighbors, well, all 10 of them come back to you. So now you have 11 copies of yourself running. Well, and actually, that wasn't the case. Okay. The worm deposited a little I am here file in there. And if it arrived on a machine that said, I am here, it wouldn't infect it again. Now, it's still true that all the testing you're talking about happened. And that is why the connections got busy of machines saying, can I infect you? Can I infect you? Can I infect you? But it also meant that it didn't reinfect a machine that was already infected, which of course, you know, bad guys have security problems too, meant it's easy to do a vaccine. You just create that file. Mm -hmm. And it's, oh, I'm, I'm already here. I'm not going to do this again. And I think there was an analogy a couple of years ago when someone had found out what was a bot uh, that was supposed to have a command and control IP address mm -hmm. with a domain that had not yet been registered. Uh -huh. And the guy went out and registered the domain and then basically defused the bomb before it detonated. Yep. Because it, so yep. there's, there's a lot of these things. So we've changed an awful lot in some respects, the complexity of the Internet and the amount of connectivity and simply the number of users. But sudden things really haven't changed a whole lot. And, and as they say, someone who was there very early, how would you describe that evolution over the last several decades now? Well, there certainly were things that Steve and I would say, oh, you know, here's an example from the book, actually. You, you know, you say, gee, wouldn't it be awful if somebody did this? Because it isn't hard to think of things that hadn't been tried that, that might work. Uh, I can talk about my packet cannon, for example which was a term management did not want me to use. But Steve and I were, were talking about what was eventually called the sin packet attack against kernels. He knew that um, you could attack a kernel so much that it's uh, the algorithm it used for checking incoming TCP connections would weight down its CPU. And he, he had this in the, the, the book and deleted the two sentences uh, just before it went to press about this. That, and this was difficult. First of all, our general policy was, let's tell about these bad things because the bad guys have time to look it up. The good guys are reading the book and this will help them. But he took that out because he didn't know a way to fix it. By, I guess it was 96 with the panics attacks and so on, the sin packet attack arrived. And I actually helped the New York Times at one point. They said, are we being attacked? And you know, I had to go check that out and so on. 
And it turned out that a team of internet gray beards had a exchanged email for a week discussing algorithms and Patricia trees and all that sort of stuff and came up with a solution, which very quickly appeared in Sun and other kernels to make, make this attack much less effective. Um, so there were things we thought about, wouldn't it be awful if they did this, which later showed up. A lot of it is just the same stuff, only more so. You know, I, I hear the term advanced persistent threats, and I think, well, they are persistent and they are threats. Most of it is not new, though I certainly, I, I keep my eye on technology. There, there are new things to attack, uh, obviously, and wonderful, just wonderful ideas, you know. Until recently, I was... Uh, served on program committees for Usenix security. And it was like Christmas with a, a batch of papers to review. And you know, you read it and read the abstract and say, what fresh hell is this now? And read about it and so on. And a lot of this stuff had been thought of and not really done or, but some was just brand new. Things like injecting non audible sounds into microphones like uh, Alexa and making Alexa think it's been talked to when you're in the room and you didn't say anything, you know, okay, that, you know, that, that's a well-known attack and there are lots of bad things that could happen, like ordering half a ton of cream corn. You know, it's more and more, uh, it's more of the same. And you really, what we need is good, strong host security. And the question is, is that even possible? And my, a lot of my f colleagues and friends disagree with me. I think it is possible. In fact, one of the talks I gave, when I retired, I sat on the farm trying to have a long view, thinking of the sort of question you just asked, what has changed? Is this going to get better? Because it doesn't look like it's going to get better. The daily newspaper constantly has reports of new hacks. And people who ought to know better, like OPM and RSA and others, keep getting hacked. So this is clearly a hard thing to do. Are we ever going to win? And I came up with a talk that said, I think we're going to win. And... First of all, there is no mathematical theorem that says this is unsolvable. We're not trying to solve the halting problem or something like that. So it isn't theoretically impossible, but it's clearly really hard. I mean, we talked earlier about CIOs trying to stop things and what do you do? There's always this tension. I remember at the labs, somebody got hacked because they were sending uh, PowerPoints around and, in email. And I was on, uh, I was frequently consulted by the press and, and, and listened to by a media relations person at the labs. And he said, well, you know, do you have this trouble in research? And I said, no, we run an old mailer. We just send ASCII around. This is, <laughs> we don't worry about videos arriving that have bad stuff in them. And after we hung up, the media relations person said, how can you say we're running old stuff here at the labs? And he said, because it's safe and understood. And, and honey, I'll be home in five minutes does not need to be a formatted document with macros and, and Turing completeness in it. And, you know, that's pretty much the way it was. So I run Microsoft Defender. Yeah. And as a security person, I do documents. I'm, I'm doing a, a, a couple work with some clients on ransomware exercises. Mm -hmm. So I've created text files where I keep my notes. I'm, I'm still an old ASCII type of a guy. If I'm on a phone call, yeah. I'm taking notes in Notepad. Yeah. And then I save it. Well, this is true, and this happened just about two weeks ago, and it happened again a couple of days ago when Defender says, oops, we have found some files on your machine. We want to send them back to Microsoft for analysis. Are you okay? Do you want to review them? I said, of course I want to see what yeah. you're sending back to the yeah. mothership. Every single one of them yeah. was a .txt file, and it had the word, or actually the character sequence, R-A-N-S-O-M-W-A-R-E in it, because we're talking about a ransomware exercise or this particular, I, mean, I kid you not. And it, it's scoured through all of my documents and even my desktop. Word the word ransomware in a text file and Microsoft said, this is evil. That's sort of sounding like what was uh, suspected of Kaspersky Labs a few years ago. When, yeah. If you remember the exfil where, yep. hey, if your file matches a known hash, then it's okay, you can run it. If it matches a known bad hash, we'll quarantine it. Yeah. But if it doesn't match any hash, let's upload a copy, put it in a Petri dish, grow oh. it, see if it's good or not. Oh. Well, nothing says you can't look for certain terms like joint strike fighter or whatever and say, yes. ooh, that looks evil, let's upload it. And I'm wondering, has Microsoft taken a page out of the KGB or the, the successor organization's Actually, book? I have some background for you. Those Looking for those words, they're called dirty words in the spook business. And of course, Cliff Stahl, 
back in, in those days, put up uh, something called SDI net, which was full of dirty words. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that if you have Hallram or Thorium or fusion reaction or what, you know, the spark plug, lots of words like that. And you, some of you may want to look up what those really mean, uh, means that maybe they're talking about something bad. And I actually proposed a, uh, a patent. I don't remember where it went, but this was at the labs looking for packets going by that had dirty words in them. Now you don't want a list of dirty words, but if you have a, a bloom filter that is a hash table that will go off when it sees a dirty word, then that's harder to for someone to tell what's in the table. And then you could report the dirty word and say, I've just seen this traffic flow has dirty words in it. And maybe that's the sort of thing you want to watch because really watching what's going on inside is a key part to security. And really what we're talking about is a primitive form of DLP, data loss prevention, where you say, yeah. hey, and I had a friend of mine when I was teaching at SANS that he put together a night talks, a DLP fail. And he had like a dozen ways that you could evade DLP. And his conclusion was, if you're into a system, it's trivial to avoid these things. Just 443 on your way out or encrypted or just yep. XOR it with something. And yep. they just went on and on and on of a whole list of ways around. But let's turn our conversation maybe to, okay, today we have similar issues. We're much more connected. We have our cloud presence. We have our own local hosts. We have people working from home after two years of COVID and they don't want to come into the office except maybe when you have free lunches and things such as that. <laughs> And so what does that do to complicate our problem of keeping everything inside when, as you had observed, it was like circling the wagons around Wyoming, and now really there isn't even a border? Of course, the whole problem with inside has always been flawed. Uh, firewalls and perimeter security is, is a medium level security at most. Ask the Australians who got COVID. You, you know, Australia and New Zealand were doing perimeter defense against COVID and you knew it wasn't going to work very well. That has never been that strong. And in fact, what Steve and I proposed in the book is you do things like put security cameras inside your vaults because you really need to see what's inside because inside isn't, isn't so great. Though it, what a perimeter defense does do is it keeps the casual poke, people poking out, but still you probably want to really monitor the payroll computer network inside. And, and so on. And that's hard to do. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but that's hard to do because uh, inside you're more collegial. You know, I, I worked at uh, AT&T Labs for a few years and it was clear to me that AT&T has got to be a target for, for spooks. If, if nothing else, you'd like the billing records of congressmen so you can find who's walking on the Appalachian Trail, who's talking to their girlfriends, uh, where people are and so on. This and, and you can change that into money or really important stuff. So how do you monitor the inside of a very large network to look for the bad stuff? Assuming you just start at the beginning, there are bad guys in this network. How do you do that without invading everybody's work, even if you're allowed to? And I remember we were not allowed to run as a, a basically a, a, a web walker to scrape web pages inside. That was against policy. Uh, now I could have I I could have talked to the powers that be and said, look, I need to do this, and we got to see what's put up, but that's that's hard to do. And so now that you're at home, you've got a little piece of the corporation here at home through your VPN. One of the things I did. Oh, uh, so you mentioned network mapping. I went to a Highlands forum sometime around 1976, which was actually from the Navy, and run by Dick O'Neill, and it was periodic meetings of various impressive people talking about subjects. And I went to one where we did a RAND Corporation study. You're assuming it's 10 years in the future and a series of buzzword compliant attacks have occurred on the internet. And your job is to brief the president. Okay, this is a new thing. And the question is, what information would you like to have had in place to be able to give you the information you'd need for that briefing? And then you, the game goes, okay, it's a few weeks later and now the buzzword compliant attack is much, much worse. And what, what do you need to do? Okay, now it's 10 years before, what can we do to prepare for that? And you know, back in the eighties, there was ARPANET and there was MILNET. And 
When, and bad things would happen on the ARPANET. It'd be on the front page of the New York Times. And when that happened, the Milnet would cut its connection to the world. You know, the turtle would pull its head in. Would we be able to do that in 2005 when something bad happened? Well, you'd want to know where the connections are. And I thought, gosh, you'd need a map. Well, who could, who could make a map of all of this? Well, you know, companies could do it and you know, government could do it. I said, this would be an interesting research project. So the idea I came up with was you run Traceroute to a quarter million destinations. You build a graph, make a pretty picture, and you do this repeatedly over time and analyze for changes and so on. And when the attack comes, you look at the graph and say, oh, look, the Navy's connected there. You know, this is where they, they should disconnect if they're going to do that. And of course, maps can be very interesting otherwise. And the mapping project uh, progressed in May 1999. Uh, NATO got into a war with Serbia. And Steve Bellavin said, Chez, you should watch that closely. So I found a whole bunch of Class C networks for Croatia, Serbia, and so on, and added that to my daily scan. And in early May of 1999, the newspaper reported that the power was being cut to Serbia. They were dropping carbon fibers on the, the power lines and so on and doing that. And I said, ooh, I wonder what part of the networks went away and made a special little graph of it. S -S Steve Brannigan, a colleague of mine, made a movie of it. And, you know, the idea was the movie would show the network disappearing and what it showed it's, in part, it showed where it was disappearing. And I remembered I'd used that map to go look at a Serbian web page, which was, had pictures of dead babies down the side and down the middle had words like Hiroshima, Dresden, and so on, you know, with Serbian mixed in. I said, okay, this is a, uh, this is a propaganda web page inside for Serbians. Well, I, I'm not a practicing attacker, but I had the attack tools. I could take that page down. Should I? Suddenly, the Republic of Cheswick needs a foreign policy, which, first of all, probably would upset the Department of State who thinks they're in charge of that. And so I, I, I looked at that and said, well, first of all, I don't think the Serbs are fooled by this sort of stuff. And secondly, if I take it down, they're going to have less access to the rest of the Internet, probably. And it open is better. So I decided to leave it up. That was my political decision. And I also found there was one Yugoslavian site that didn't go away. And it turned out that the site just before it was a Verizon router in Maryland. And I gave this talk in Washington in a few places. And a general at one said, son, you've done remote assessment of bomb damage and we're interested. This is a guy sitting at home in his pajamas running trace route and looking at the results. And there's a lot of results. He also said, oh, that part that didn't go away, that's got to be their embassy. Ooh, that's interesting too. I mean, maps are cool. And, you know, so I made these maps for about 10 years. We started a company. I'll get back to that in a moment based on it. I got to visit the office of the chief cartographer of National Geographic in Washington. Well, it's the, the center of the map world, really. And we talked about this sort of stuff. I... I took copies of these maps all over the place. In fact, the TSA guys at the airport got used to the guy with this laws rocket type tube going out uh, to various places and they were sent around. I still get notes from people who say, yeah, it's still hanging up in the FCC, you know, that sort of stuff, the, the maps. In fact, someone told me, yeah, I, I use it for the first slide of my talk. And I heard that just here at this conference. But what also happened in 1999, I, you know, I had realized, of course, that corporate networks were a mess. You know, they don't know where it goes. It turns out, I've learned in retrospect, and this is probably still true, that every company has about two IP addresses per employee. Now, that's probably changed. I haven't watched for a while. I've been retired, you know, every day is Saturday. But that means you get a pretty big network with somebody like Lucent or AT&T and so on. Do they know where it goes? And of course, I talked to enough CIOs and I've been in them. They didn't know where it went. So, well, I can do this mapping thing pick a whole bunch of destinations and map it and we'll color it. And we'll color it one color for known networks and another color for unknown networks. By the way, you don't use red and green. They're colorblind people. Yeah, yeah, got to do, you know, this is visualization stuff. Learned a lot of, of visualization stuff. You go do that and they, they look at a map and it has this big red area among all the blue and they go and look and say, and I 
I heard this once from, it was BP, I think. Yeah. It's those guys in Oklahoma. I know they weren't paying attention to us. They, I knew they didn't have a firewall. And the other thing I invented was a way to see if a machine could talk to the inside and the outside of the network at the same time from far away. And I got a patent for it. It's, I call it leak detection, and it's done with spoofed packets. So spoofing is not always evil. And, and that reported connections that you didn't expect to be there. And I said, I think this would be a product. And Lucent Ventures guy said, but we think so too. And so in September 2000, several of us spun off a company called Lumetta. And that company still runs, which is a great research result. You know, it's been 22 years. The idea is still working. There are people working on it. It's useful. I, sitting in my lab room, I thought, I think a CIO would probably pay 50 grand for this information. I was wrong. They pay half a million dollars for the information. Okay, nice to be wrong like that. And it turns out the U.S. government, uh, who had been watching my network stuff, the folks at DISA knew all about me. The, the U.S. government ended up at least at one year paid $8 million for it. And of course, the leak detection, the leak detection is interesting because if you have enclaves like top secret and secret, you want to know if packets leak out of the top secret to the secret. However, are you allowed to run the test? Well, there are security rules about intentionally leaking data. On the other hand, as one of the security guys said, yeah, these rules mean that you have to understand the risks you're taking and do what you're going to do. By the way, a friend of mine, Carl Seal, found in one of our scans that we had pinged a nuclear submarine. Yes, I've sent, we've sent a tracer out to a nuclear submarine and it went down. It was the SSN Hawaii. And we got the, the packet in January of the particular year we found it. And it was easy to tell that submarines have class C networks each. And it was in the middle of the Navy assignment. But I went and looked up the submarine. It had its name. Turns out the conning tower was put on four months later. Okay, so it was under construction. You know, it wasn't actually sailing under the ocean answering my, my trace routes. But still, it's fun to have pinged the nuclear submarine. So, and, you know, they use this stuff a lot. And I don't have the clearance to know exactly what they found. But they said it's safe to say that the Republic is a bit safer because they're running our software. It's kind of interesting. What's, what's happening these days is that the government is making effort to call it CMMC. Yeah, it's kind of a new, it's a new acronym. It's a four-letter word for those who have to deal with it. But what we're looking at is that it's a, com a security model for what's now called controlled unclassified information, or CUI. Oh, okay. It used to be... This was you know, for official use only? It used to be, F used to be FOUO or... Or confidential. Not confidential. No. Anything that's not classified. Okay. It could be personal information, yeah. PII, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, any you know, you know, restricted, all these things like that. Yep. But what they did is they said, hey, you know what? We don't really do a good job of managing that because we might, even if assuming <sighs> that we've locked up every single bit of our confidential secret, top secret and beyond, yeah. what have you got? there's so much in the unclass world that oh. if you're a foreign agent, you can pretty much reconstruct yep. because people talk around things. Hey, Bill, you know that round thing with the purple dot on it with the, you yeah, can't yeah, describe yeah. it but you get there and so cmmc started out i did an episode on that i'm gonna do another one because uh, they've changed I, I studied it I, I paid the fees i took the course i got certified and then they said oh yeah we're going to completely change everything and here's a new version 2.0 but basically it looks at nist 800 171 looks at all those controls mm -hmm. it sets three different levels of compliance so if you're a federal contractor in the Department of Defense space, as we're yeah. starting, they're saying, well, you have to, at a minimum, meet, let's say, level one. Well, right. wait a minute. I just, I, I sell ballpoint pens to the Navy. Yeah. How many? This is the pizza around the Pentagon question. Right. right. That's right. And, and so those, it's a more modest requirement yep. than to say, well, I say, I send missile seeker heads and I, I provide okay. those to the Air Force, but there's still unclassed stuff that you need to do. But the leak detection was interesting, as you'd mentioned that, because... In some of the early conversations we had talking about CMMC, we said they're basically unclassified enclaves. Yeah. Just like you, here's your, you're going to lock up and we're going to have our sipper net for our secret or going to have JWIX for our, our you know, highly yep. classified stuff. We're now going to have to create these little secure enclaves. Uh -huh. And the concept of leak detection is a way of validating, did you do it right? Just That's occurred right. to me as a result That's of this right. conversation. And, yep. and there may be another business opportunity there to say- well, I 
I suspect the folks at Lumetta know all about this. I don't chat with them very much anymore, but uh, this is, you know, they, they have plenty of people in this area. And, yeah, well, now know. everybody else knows about it. They listen yeah, to the podcast. Right. Yeah. But so we didn't let a cat uh, out of the bag. But it's important, as you had said, to make the Republic more secure. Yeah, absolutely. You get feedback from people saying, and that I understand this came from NipperNet. We didn't know you were going to check. We knew it was against the policy, but, you know, we, so, you know, check but verify, as Reagan quoted the Russians as saying. In fact, we have that quote in Russian in our firewalls book. I, there was a Russian lady working at the labs and I had her. Trust but verify. Trust yeah. but verify. But she, you know, it's in there in the Cyrillic <laughs> like that. Yeah, the, I was very pre- pleased with the leak detection. Turns out one packet. You, you send it, you know the inside address. You send anything, a UDP packet, to the inside address with a return address of some outside public machine, which we call the MIT, M-I-T-T. And if a response comes back, a ping answer or a no such address or whatever, you've got enough in the packet to, to know where you originally sent it. And that's some machine that can talk both ways with a packet that should have been filtered by a firewall. Now, is that going to work? only for non-RFC 1918 addresses? That is, if I'm doing NAT and I got 192.168 on the inside, I can't really send a bogon through the internet. You, well, the target, the, sort, the destination address would be the one, the 1980 address, the inside one. But the, the return address isn't. It's mm-hmm. some public address. And if it comes back, yeah, you found it. Yeah. And of course, if you find machines on the outside, you can do this in the reverse and see if they get stuff coming in. And it was an easy uh, report. It's interesting. The software was all written in Unix in shell scripts and stuff, which was of great concern to people who wanted to buy us. Microsoft came and said, maybe we'll buy this company. And they looked and, and the technology was all shell scripts and stuff. And they said, this, this is not going to run on Windows. And, and they went away. We lost that, that sale. But, you know, that's how I prototype things. We didn't have a report generator that would compute queries what we did was pre, try to pre-compute answers to any questions you were going to ask. So what would you want to know about this? And I was cranking out reports. Oddly enough, this was HTML generated by shell scripts. One of the things I said was, you know, our trace routes, we get routing loop information. Would someone want a routing loop report? Well, I've got the data. I'll sit here and I'll spend the morning and make reports for it. And it turns out when they ran this on Cipernet, we were told it was the first report they went for. Because if you have a secret connection someplace and it's getting loaded down by a routing loop, that can show off a connection you don't want to be seen. They said that was very useful. How cool was that? <laughs> no, jackpot. I love that. So what, what do you see going forward in the future? I mean, as you said, oh, you, you, okay. you kind of moved into every day is oh, Saturday retirement, but yeah. it's not stopping. The world's no. still moving. Okay, so... I think we can win this. And the reason I think, first of all, is there's no mathematical reason to do it. It is possible to write bug-free software. It's hard. It depends on what your definition of bug-free is. But some of the things, we, we have several things going for us. First of all, if we get a solution that's right, we can share it for free. And I actually have had a friend who worked at the CIA who was working on JWIX and certifying software for JWIX. And he was going through looking at public software and approving it and so on. And I said, you know, if you release this as being proven to the world, that could help the rest of us. And it gives someone a chance to check your work and give you feedback. Wouldn't that help you justify your black budget? You know, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, but if you get it right, you can share it. And you could have standards that do that. Now, we, we try to do that, but we have things like the SSL thing from a few years ago. Uh, you know, oh, my God. We're, we're, we're counting on three guys to get it right, and they blew it. And, uh, you know, how much did that cost the world? $100 billion? That's worth spending. We, we, we can fix that. You could make a library that didn't have that property. Well, how? Well, not only do you be careful. That's one thing you do. We are much better at proving software, though, of course, once you get mathematical proofs of software, then you're debugging the specification. And that's expensive and hard, but maybe you only have to do that once or twice or have people reviewing it to get that right. Personal responsibility. The mailer I like is Postfix because Beats of Venema was extremely careful about his own software. But I'm reminded of, uh, what was it called? Dockmaster. 
Dockmaster was the mailer for the NSA that was connected to the public network. And I understand the people who went to the boss and said, we want to put this up. The boss said, you can put it up. If it gets hacked, you're fired. And maybe you'll lose your pension. I don't remember if that part was it. You can't really do that, but you could threaten it. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe you can. Maybe you can, yeah. But you certainly can fire him. Yeah. And that focuses the mind beautifully. It's sort of like, as I call it, skinny dipping on the internet. If your host is on the internet and you care about security, you're going to learn what, what can happen. You know, turn off those network services and don't import trouble and so on. I've had the privilege to know two chief scientists at Bell Lab, uh, at, at NSA. Uh, Bob Morris hung out with me for quite a bit. And, you know, you, boy, you just shut up and listen. You know, as he said, security people are paid to think bad thoughts. And Steve Bellavin and I went to him to the crypto museum. And he was immediately pulled aside by the head of the museum and warned, you know what all this stuff is. This is a bad place to make unacceptable comments about it because the person next to you is going to understand what's going on. Uh, That was an amazing day, actually. It's, It's good to hang out with top security guys and listen to what they have to say. And of course, a lot of them are in the government. I remember I, I met Earl Bo Bear, and that was the last security talk I heard that blew my doors away. You know, and he was at Sandia. And, you know, uh, the rest of the security talks are good, but you know, I've, I've, I've said them and I've heard them all, who knows. So I think with these things, we can build tools that can actually be trustable. And that includes operating systems, That includes safer languages. I'm a big fan of the Go language. I'd love to see a a cell phone built on Go by security nerds. And I think one, and the other thing you can do is you can anneal the software. I don't know if you remember, but in the eighties, SendMail, my friend, Eric Allman, who is here. His car is parked outside outside with his license plate, SendMail. Eric, you know, he he changed the world with SendMail. It carried the mail around. It ran as root. It had intentional, well-known backdoors. And it was the source of numerous break-ins, including the Morris worm. Over the years, SendMail is still out there. It still handles a lot of it. And last time I went, I said, I wonder how SendMail's doing now. And just let's go look at the security problems. I couldn't find one for a long time. And I think what's happened here is that it has been annealed the way you would harden a piece of steel. You know, if you throw away enough bugs and keep thinking about it and being annoyed by this, you might actually be able to patch something into, into more solid work. That is not ideal, but, you know, you fix things. It's what engineers do. We're almost at the end of our, our time here, but this has been fascinating. Any, any parting thoughts that you might want to leave everybody before we wrap up? It's still a wide open field. We, we need security experts, and it's clear it's still lots of hard problems to solve. When you lose a database of, of people with clearances, Oh my God, think of how that can be abused. Who's, who's working at the embassy who's not in that database? He must be tippy top secure. You know, this is, you know, oh, the, uh, this stuff is amazing. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I have a good call. I think we will win. I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime, but I think we can do better and we have to insist on it. And maybe a UL sort of thing. I know Mudge who's much in the news these days. Uh, uh, Mudge was thinking about UL laboratories where you actually have some trusted people who actually approve your Wi-Fi camera. And I think there's some proposals out there in the short near future to do something similar to that. I've seen they, some of those they, government They've tried. Um, you know, there have been, uh, what was it, CCOM ratings or something like that. I don't remember what it was. They did, you, you know, a checklist is not good enough. Because I went through the checklist. I've got a firewall. I'm secure now. No, 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 no. It isn't like that. Well, I've got a feeling that we could talk for another 45 minutes or even beyond, and we'd love it. And maybe I'll get you back on the show again. I'd but, be happy to come back. So thank you. This is Bill Cheswick. This is G. Mark Hardy. We're kind of uh, chatting up some old friends here who have been around a long time. And as they say, Bill's been here longer than I have and had some just fascinating experiences. So I, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've got learned a little bit about some of the the stories, the insights, possibly being able to even look at problems we're facing today to say, you know, they're not that different than what we're looking at 30 years ago. They're just bigger and hairier, but you shave them all down and they still look about. Well, thank you for listening. This is CISO Tradecraft. And uh, as we ask you as always, please go ahead and follow us on LinkedIn if you're not doing so already. So you can look at some of the information that we push out during the week. 
like us on your podcast platform if you haven't already, and ideally give us a five-star review, which helps boost our ratings and lets other people find us a little bit easier. Until next time, stay safe out there.